Welcome, welcome, welcome back to another John R. with JB. It's a pleasure to uh, be back with all of you fine people. Uh, before I begin, uh, as always, I want to say a warm and heartfelt thank you to all of you who've seen fit to subscribe to my little channel um, and uh, come on this journey with me. Uh, it's much appreciated, uh, and uh, I want you to know that, that uh, I appreciate every one of you. So, um, with that said, let's dive right into it, right? Um, for those of you who are new to the channel, uh, basically, you know, I'm still sort of, it's a fairly new channel, I'm still sort of working out the kinks here. At the moment, I'm vacillating between my digital projects that are ongoing and doing tutorials for you guys. So in the future, I will be doing more tutorials, but um, I'm the kind of person that likes to continue one train of thought first. And right now, the train of thought I'm currently on and uh, traveling along is these Asimov fan art pieces that I'm doing and the discussing um, Asimov's influence on me as an artist and other uh, artists, visual artists, creatives as well that have influenced my work and how they all kind of tie in and relate to each other and also touching on my painting process. Um, so right now what I'm doing is I'm just kind of working on Beta Durrell in the foreground here. Um, if you look down here, I have to lay in her shadow. Um, and I'm referencing some Hugh Fleming art here, cutaway of Nomi Sunrider. I just like the way Hugh has handled the values here. And I've changed up the costume quite a bit. Um, I've kept some of the call outs of the original design that he used, but basically I looked a lot at uh, Padme Amidala's costume from the prequels, design of that costume to kind of get a sense of how the fabric would flow over the form and whatnot. And as a visual artist, whether you're a traditional painter or whether you're a digital painter, I think it's a really good idea to have a wide array of references and influences that you draw from. It's a, this is a common theme I'm finding with my videos is I touch a lot on artistic reference and how to correctly incorporate reference into your work. And I really feel like, you know, it's one of those things that, at least when I was a Pratt, they didn't really go over it um, unless you actively would seek out a teacher and pick their brain on their individual process, right? Like, um, so my teacher and mentor at Pratt, uh, one Mr. Floyd Hughes, the uh, artist on Ghost Rider from Marvel in the 80s, worked on a bunch of other things. He went for the went by the pseudonym Reggie Jones. Uh, really eloquent, delightful guy, sweet man, and. Uh, uh, it's a pleasure and a privilege to have studied under him when I was at Pratt. And he uh, he really was very insightful in the way that he worked. He was one of those guys that would just dip into every medium, but he was the first guy to tell us, like, do not eschew digital. Don't, don't dismiss digital art. But don't give that up if you're currently practicing at it because the industry is shifting in that direction. It's just a valuable skill set to know. That being said, he also said the best way to get good at digital is to get good at traditional, which I agree with. I think that some artists might respectively disagree with me, some very big name and established artists probably, and I understand where their disagreements are coming from. However, I think when you're, especially when you're starting out, the best way to get a firm grasp of the fundamentals, perspective, anatomy, value, color harmony, how colors relate to each other, how shapes and structure, how shapes relate to each other to create coherent and naturalistic looking structure. Those things are best learned in a traditional, through a traditional art vehicle in terms of picture making. You know, I mean, the reason I'm able to take advantage of all the tools and goodies that digital affords me is because I did three years of oil painting postgraduate. I did two years of oil painting while I was a Pratt. And then I've done 10 to 11 years of drawing draftsmanship and working in comics. And all that experience has informed how I create my images on the computer. Um, and it's something that I think is important, right? Uh, now, the other thing I'll do is sometimes if I'm rushing, I'll use the color picker to color to rip directly off the reference. However, I try to avoid that. I try to make a palette for each section of my painting that I'm working on. And typically I base my digital palettes off of a Zorn limited palette. 
for all, I tried to envision all of my colors coming from a Zorn limited palette. Um, I kind of like, you know, will guesstimate, you know, a gray line um, or occasionally look at my work in black and white, for example, I'll zoom out and I'll just shift this to black and white, edit, or, or image rather, adjustments. If we go to black and white, it's gonna turn only one, one layer into black and white. But you can see that values pretty much check out there. I can cancel. So that's just an insight into my painting process. These edges, I'm definitely gonna you know soften these up a little bit as I would travel down the form here. We'll probably have some spot shines on the cape here. Um, maybe soften this up a tiny bit, maybe not. You know, as I develop this into a cohesive whole, that's going to inform how I handle those edges to make it look like this is all one piece functioning as a, you know, representative looking image, right? Even though this is something I've made completely out of my head with the Val Beat with the benefit of tons of reference. The image itself is my brainchild in terms of how I'm arranging all these disparate objects, right? Um, and that's something that is a skill that's best learned from observational painting, drawing, figure drawing. Also, I did tons of observational drawing, whether it was location. Um, over the years, I would say from 2005, 2007, I, uh, you know, leading up to Pratt, I did nothing but observational drawing. Um, very much steeped in impressionism too, trying to capture the essence of what I was seeing and not preconceived. I think that's super important. And I think it's beneficial. And frankly, it's something I don't do enough of anymore. Just because you know, I'm I'm knee deep in this or that project. And I'm kind of my mental vocabulary, not that like I'm a master by any stretch. I don't consider myself a master or even close to a master. Um, but my mental vocabulary has enough has enough of a backlog of images stored in its databanks where I'm able to kind of recall an image and execute that image with relative um, relative ease usually, right? If I have some decent photo reference. So right now what I'm doing is I'm just, you can see I've worked about here. My opacity is 82. I like to keep my opacity at 80 when I'm working digitally. And again, I approach all these pieces like an oil painting. And this is more um, just me recapping my painting process. Some of, my, some of you who have been following the channel for a while now, I've gone over this a few times, but for the benefit of those who are jumping in, my, my oil painting process, I use a Zorn Limited palette. So a Zorn Limited palette is basically a, um, it is yellow ochre, uh, ivory black, titanium white, vermilion red, but in, uh, in the modern era, we would typically substitute vermilion with a less toxic color, so a cad red. You know, if you want to bring a little heat to your palette, cad red is always a good way to go. Like, there's definitely cad red in here in her face. She's got a nice cinnamon color to her face. Very racially ambiguous, which is kind of what I'm going for since this is the foundation. And this takes plenty, 20 plus thousand years in the future. You figure at that point, we would be moving more towards a post-racial humanity in the sense that all the races would be blending together into this racially ambiguous whole. <laughs> Although, you know, then you have to take into account planets, right? Like what if you, what if for the last 10,000 years, your civilization has grown up in a, in a low gravity planet? Um, what happens then? Do humans get taller on that planet as opposed to another planet? You tell me, scientists in the audience, <laughs> right. Um, so now I'm going to sort of guesstimate my palette here for the hand, this flesh palette. Um, I see quite a bit of heat in this palette again. Uh, rather like that. So we'll go with this. I'm going to try to do this palette over the water so that I could clearly see what's going on. And I'm just gonna move this more in the red key and keep going down here. That's not gonna work. Yeah, look at that nice lush. Let's get a little more heat. Warm and cool. I also had a, I had a teacher at Pratt. His name was Andrew Lanigan. He was a visiting professor and he was one of these guys who was very much all about like warm and cool. Very into color theory. 
actually a pretty cool guy. He was a little bit socially awkward. Like, um, you know, when I met him in quiet, it's very cerebral. And initially, I don't think the class knew what to make of him. But <laughs> we started talking about Rambo and he opened up. <laughs> I remember at the time Rambo, I think four was coming out. And he was like, one day he just pulled me aside and was like, hey, James, um, what do you think of the latest Rambo? And I was like, oh, sweet. I didn't know you, <laughs> you were into Rambo, Professor Lanigan. That's awesome. <laughs> He had a smile on his face. <laughs> I mean, that's just a, that's one of the beautiful things about art school. I mean, I know a lot of, again, a lot of artists I respect, very deeply respect, will tell you, do not waste your time with art school. And I have to say, they bring up very good points. The cost has become extremely prohibitive. And in a lot of cases, you are better served just going to a reputable atelier, supplementing that art education with a gen ed education at a local community college if economic if the economics don't work out right or going to a state school if you live in new york we have the Celsius program which admittedly has a million strings attached but uh, it's still a program that you can take advantage of it wasn't around years ago um but that being said <clears throat> you know um the benefits just still exist. It's just it's a cost benefit analysis, right? So if you have the money, like let's say money's not an object and you could go to a Pratt or a Parsons or an SVA, would I recommend it? Certainly. Although I will say that you're not going to be good enough in four years to work. You have to know that going in. And what you have to do is while you're there, actively seek out the knowledge and supplement that maybe with some sort of more, again, like a same thing as if you were going to community college or supplement your art education with a track at an atelier so after you graduate and you have that piece of paper and maybe you've cross-trained in a in a tangentially related discipline like graphic design right you can continue studying at at that atelier that you're at um whether it's the art students league or for example something like that continue your studies there and then in another few years after that you'll probably up to be up to par ready to show your work to art directors and that doesn't mean you shouldn't wait till then to show your work to art directors i would recommend showing your art work to art directors while you're in school, which is something I did at Pratt, which me and my friend Ken, who's an artist at DC at the moment, or I think he's still doing some work here and there for DC. He uh, he is uh, doing a lot of creator around at the moment, but worked for years at DC. Him and I did that. Started going to conventions around 2008 and uh, served us well. A little bit of a rude awakening. <laughs> I remember he, uh, my friend, again, my friend Ken Marion, he went to he had a story about how the first convention that we went to was Comic-Con way back in 2008, New York Comic-Con, and showed his work to a guy. And the guy looked at him, and this is like his junior, senior year at Pratt, and he goes, you ever think about going to art school? <laughs> it's kind of my, my eye opening, but it's good to kind of get that sort of like straight talk once in a while, because it will force you to get better. I mean, the thing is like, sometimes people are jerks about it, right? Sometimes they'll tell you stuff in a way where you don't want to hear it, but you have to develop the ability as an artist who's trying to improve to kind of sift through what is subjective criticism and what is objective constructive criticism, right? And I do think, I will say this, I do think though a good, a good critique will point out your strengths as well as your weaknesses. Although that doesn't say you can't glean valuable information from, you know, uh, being told what those weaknesses are that you may or may not have been aware of. So just something to think about, right? Um, let's see here. What time are we at? We're at 404. I have to go teach an in-person class soon. So I'm going to cut this around 430. I'll try to mask. I'm just going to try to block in these basic shapes and then we'll probably cut it for today. And the next time I do a video, I will ideally be working on a new piece in my Asimov fan art series here. I hope everybody's having a lovely summer. I'm looking forward to being with my fiance up in Vermont. I'm going to be moving up there. For those of you who don't know, I teach online. I teach with a company, um, Dragonfly Designs. So I'm developing a curriculum with them. And I also teach, I'll be teaching locally in the Burlington area at uh, Burlington City Arts. If you're in the Burlington area and you see this, Burlington, Vermont. Feel free to, you know, drop by Burlington City Art in late September. And, uh, you know, 
be happy to meet you. And it would be great to meet some of my subscribers or it's assuming anybody here that subscribed to me is from Burlington. I know my fiance is subscribed to me. <laughs> She's from Burlington, technically. All right, um, let's see here. What am I going to do? Let's, let's make another layer for this study I'm doing of the hands here. So the hands, um, again, you want to have that training, that foundation to kind of just go in and nail down silhouette. <clears throat> not the easiest thing to do and i'm also i also will now use my small monitor to look at what i'm doing so that it helps me gauge am i getting the anatomy right when i look at things so far away it's kind of like the equivalent of stepping 15 feet back from a painting if you're in like an atelier right and you're, you step back from the painting to see the big picture you blur your vision to see how the big shapes are relating together. Let's go back to uh, here. Trying to mass in these planes. That's the other thing you want to do is you want to be cognizant of the planes when you're doing things like hands. You want to try to get this front plane here. So I'm going to try and get this side plane. Silhouette's important, and I don't think people realize that. They don't take that into account nearly enough. You want to get the structure down. Whatever you're doing, you want to get that structure, right? <clears throat> Super duper important. Um, music is still playing. Don't worry. So... Hopefully we don't get interrupted by interlopers. I'm down, I told people I was recording, but we may get a few third party people coming into our stream here. Another thing you want to be aware of is women hands tend to be different. They tend to, the, the knuckles and things are less, there's less emphasis on all that action when you're doing female hands for better or worse. I know if you're curious, uh, I know the foundation trailer dropped. Last week. Um, and I did a reaction to it. So if you're curious about my reaction, check out last week's video. I go over my reaction in detail to the foundation trailer. I have to say I'm, I am excited. Not too bad. We want to kink this up a little bit. This actually flares out quite a bit. Gives us a little more room. <clears throat> zoom out a little bit. Let me save. I'll zoom out. And then we want to flip our image. If I was doing this physically, I would take a photo on my phone, flip it on my phone, look at the mirror image, check it, how it looks in grayscale occasionally, get that black and white, um, you know, value check. Oh, 
Let's just undo that command Z. We'll flip it again. Image rotation, flip canvas horizontal. All right, so not bad. And you can see how the body does not look unnatural when I flip it, right? Right now it doesn't quite work with, with the feet because I haven't laid in that shadow. But I've got good reference for the shadow as well. The shadow is actually different in the Hugh, like the, the value structure is, is actually substantially different in Hugh's rendition of Nomi Sunrider. So I took certain cues from that value structure. If you get like, you know, you're gonna get if it's front lit, if you have ambient light, you're gonna get these closest parts to you. That there, those parts closest to you are gonna be brighter. So you're gonna get, as you go around the surface of the leg, you're gonna get some shadows, right? That's not gonna really change. But what's going to change is sort of the direction of the light. And, you know, in his, the shadow is going back. In mine, the shadow is gonna be going forward and to the side, based on the values that I have set up here. I imagine this is either a binary star system or a star or a star system that has like a gas giant in it that also reflects light. So um, we have like you know that kind of dynamic going on. <clears throat> At this point, what I want to do is just uh, switch back up here. Come in. And I just want to, you know, come in and get that. Doesn't matter if like this goes down a little bit. Maybe I want to like really lay in a nice, almost like a straight black here. Let me see how that tracks from far away. Not bad. You'll get a little rim light at around certain parts of the figure too. That's something that people tend to forget. Um, uh, one of the guys that I watch, Adam Duff, he's a really, really uh, fast, prolific, and knowledgeable artist. Tons of experience working for big companies and whatnot and uh just a, and a fascinating guy and um he touches on that in his video which i find interesting so i'm just gonna save this and then I, what i want to do is come in and just i want to shift this to a brown key here and start to lay in some details on this gauntlet A lot of the browns and reds in here, very cinnamon, very earthy. I am kind of largely keeping this gauntlet the same. What I do is I go in after the fact and I blend the edges with a mixer brush similar to what you would do in oil where you would, you know, maybe put a little bit of a paint of a linseed on your brush, a tiny bit, and then load your brush up and then go in and mix your brush with like grit either going with a lighter value or darker value depending on how you wanted to blend your edges and i think i want to shift this there's a little bit of green in in this black here generally there's there's uh plenty of blacks in the green that we're seeing And then again, I'm just blocking things in right now. I'm not really stressing. Yeah. Redo that. And I think once I'm done blocking this hand in, I'll uh, I'll cut the cut the stream there.
and I'm just going through and I'm painting and just blocking in the wrist here and then I'm coming through and blocking this in and I just got an iced coffee delivered to me by my favorite subscriber. <laughs> Smash the dislike button, please, or the like button. Either helps. I need all the clout I can get. All right, and I'm going through and I'm just That was actually my, um, I'm uh, actually uh, visiting family for the fourth. That was my sister who's uh, obviously been homebound, not going to college. My 21 year old little sister, uh, she was delivering me coffee. So I believe my camera froze, um, but that's okay. There are more embarrassing angles it could have froze at and what I'm doing is just going through here and what I want to do is I want to look at what other colors are in here so we have some greens right we have some chromatic grays so maybe I want to switch to this chromatic gray but maybe I want to bring it more, again bring it more into like a green key and then go here and let's look at our brushes shall we and then let's knock the opacity down and like let's layer this in we want to lay this in so this is what you want to do is take advantage of the tools that digital affords you right So that's exactly what I'm doing here. So I'm just coming in, laying all this in. I want to get a nice sort of almost like copper. And you can see, like, basically, I've, um, I'll probably end up massing in more of the cape. Before I do that, though, I want to really just look and see, like, what I can see here. I definitely don't want to just copy what uh, Fleming did in his piece. So what I'm doing is I'm coming down and I'm just switching this around. All right, I rather like that. Let's save it. I'm gonna take a sip of this nice iced coffee that I have. I need to be caffeinated at all times. Almond milk has a sweetness to it. All right, getting back to the image at hand here, I want to look at my palette here. These are all sort of derivatives of, um, if I were going to mix this, they would be derivatives of green, black, red, yellow, and white, right? And green you get with yellow, ochre, and black, right? So you would get these colors or something analogous to these colors, right? And cut that with some red. Um, yellow ochre cut with white right you get to push this into more of a canary direction and then of course your cadmium reds cut with white cut with a little bit of um red and black 
which make brown, right, will give you all these reds. So that's sort of the benefit of understanding traditional painting is like you can kind of understand color family and harmony and like you have an intuitive understanding of it from just traditional painting, right? And that allows you to take full advantage of the color picker in digital. So what I wanna do now is I wanna like start laying in some of these uh, colors and I'm gonna, you know, what I do is when I mix all these forms together, I merge my layers. So right now, they're not all merged, but it's, it's all good. And I also tend to use this chalk brush here, the final touches. Let's knock up that opacity. And please, uh, don't be a stranger in the comments. Hmm. Even if it's negative comments, frankly, any like, again, any like, any comments are better than no comments, right guys? Like, I'm still a very small fish in this big YouTube ocean. Even if you wanna say, hey, you suck. Whoa. All right, that's how you feel, leave it, leave it there. I can take it. I can take it from these art directors at Disney and Lucasfilm. I can certainly take it from you, but, <clears throat> That being said, in all seriousness, because I'm kind of half kidding with that, <laughs> like try to keep the comments respectful, right? <laughs> Goes without saying. If you do have something you want to add to the conversation, by all means, uh, jump down in the comment section and please feel free to engage. I'm, I'm not like, you know, I'm not going to bite. Um, I wish that, that my Zoom camera didn't freeze on my face from that angle. Let's say that much. A nice shot of my neck beard. Okay, let me go to my layers here. And uh, I noticed I, there's probably quite a few New York peeps in the house if you're from New York. Welcome. We can enjoy the fact that we've have been voted worst traffic in the country over LA, the New York, New York area. That's something that New Yorkers can now wear as a badge of honor. I'm kind of being sarcastic there. <laughs> but hey, that's 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 the breaks, right? If you're from New York, if you grew up here, you know, you're no stranger to crazy traffic, right? You're no stranger to crazy drivers either. People in New York kind of Look at the zipper merge as an optional thing. <clears throat> Just going in. I want to actually keep these forms really impressionistic because if we look at the reference, it's actually not that tight. It's just like a mush of shapes here. It's not pea soup, but it's not really super defined either. And again, you don't want to get caught looking at your image from one angle. If you have that uh, tool, take advantage of the tools the computer affords you, right? Keep flipping that image. You know, you want to go through and don't get stuck looking at your work from one vantage point. Try to step outside of your of your of your comfort zone when looking at your work and try to perceive your work from almost like the standard the vantage point of of a patron or someone looking at the work for the first time. You know, in a gallery. Don't mind me. I'm just shifting here so that my foot doesn't fall asleep. So I tend to be very methodical. I'm like Da Vinci in that way. Not in the way that, in the way that I don't finish things, right? And not in, I'm not saying I'm anywhere near like Da Vinci in terms of skill. Please, please don't go in the comments and say, hey, you know, you got a high opinion of yourself. You think you're like Leonardo Da Vinci. No, 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 no. Da Vinci was a genius. He was far more talented than the vast majority of us will ever be. I'm not saying that. I'm saying I'm like Da Vinci in a bad way, <laughs> in the way that I just struggle to finish things. That's how I'm like Da Vinci. I, I procrastinate. If Da Vinci was notorious in his time for not finishing work. However, that's because his mind was being was wandering in different directions and he had all these ideas. He in a sense had an excuse. I don't. <laughs> right. But um he wasn't like, you know, Michelangelo, Raphael, who were kind of speedsters for their time. 
I mean, generally the pace of the pipeline for art production back then was drastically different. The market was different. The type of art was different. Like expectations were different because these guys were kind of making up the expectations and setting them as they went along. Um, but yeah, I rather like this. We're at, we got about five minutes left here and I'm not ready to sort of, I'm, again, I'm just blocking in, I'm taking my time, I'm treating this like an exploration, right? I'm treating this like a puzzle. So I wanna cut this with some more orange. So what I'm gonna do is shift this into slightly more of an orange key here. Booyah. Booyah, booyah. Let's bring some real heat to that, right? That's what I'm gonna do here. Let's just bring some real heat to this. So I'm gonna come in and I'm just gonna come in right there crazy sound effects. Another guy who does awesome art sound effects, who's also way more knowledgeable than myself, um, is Ahmed al -Duri. You should check him out. Um, I'll have to look at where I mentioned him. I'll put him in the cards again. Very, very good. If you're trying to get, if you're a traditional painter and you're kind of at a loss, I don't want to do that. I want to look an eyeball. If you're at a loss at where to begin with digital, he's a good guy to help you facilitate your transition from traditional to digital. He will uh, help you make that transition because there is a little bit of a learning curve with the software and how best to use the tools. Rather like that. this year let's get this more into a brown key Be careful of line weight too because that when you mix it that's going to translate into a weird value structure potentially if your line weights are off when you're doing your under drawing let's cut the opacity here let's switch it up let's roast let's let's uh, add a little bit of a let's cool off these shadows a little bit all right and we just lost we just lost nintendo music there we go so I'll try and finish blocking this in before I end the video. And I, right now it kind of looks like a hot mess, but that's because I haven't, you know, um, gone in and mixed all these forms. I'm still laying the base forms in here. There's a lot of red. And I just love how Hugh Fleming really is a genius when it comes to playing with color. Switch that opacity back up to 80. can't be afraid of committing to those darks and those, you know, pop and, and really like, you know, embracing the brush strokiness of painting, making, embracing the painterliness of the painting. Like, you know, you want to just lay in the forms, really. You know, and it'll come together. You got to have faith in the process. Bring some more heat to there.
and it is 431, so I'm going to cut this. But you can see how I've sort of blocked in the arm here, right? So next week I'll have this arm done, and ideally I'll have this painting done, and I'll take you on, uh, continue this journey through the Foundation Trilogy as we work on sort of our con concept for a cover, book cover for the next book in the series, which would be the second Foundation. All right, guys, well, thanks for joining me today. And until next time, um, to steal a phrase from Adam Duffman, happy drawing, right? Um, enjoy the summer weather and uh, stay safe and take care. See you next week. All right. <laughs>